morning we hosted an FPA boot camp to uh, discuss regulations about importing and exporting products under uh, FDA regulated products. We'll be holding at least two and possibly three more events in our NAFTA series before the end of the year. Information on that should have been given to you when you came into the room. And I want to make sure all of you RSVP for a very special one-time event we're having next week. Uh, it's a celebration of the uh, 70th anniversary of the signing of the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT. Uh, it's a reception for the trade community. It's free for all WIDA members. Um, and uh, we're going to have, we have an all-star crowd coming of trade luminaries. And uh, it's an open bar, and it's free. So we hope that can entice you all to be there. Um, now to today's event. It's a very special honor for us to be hosting Lance Fritz, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Union Pacific. In many ways, and I'm not sure Lance knows this, uh, this event was the impetus for our whole NAFTA series. Your team reached out to us in the spring and said they had seen that we were doing a series of events on supply chains, and global value chains. And we said we'd love to host a speech by, by, the, by you, Lance, uh, to, uh, to WIDA about supply chains. And they said, well, I want to talk about the NAFTA. And this is in the spring. And we said, well, that's great. We can do that. We can do that as part of our supply chain series. And then we kind of, in the summer, decided, the board decided we wanted to do an NAFTA series. And we said, you know what, this will be the linchpin event for the series. So. Uh, you really, uh, you actually helped spur this whole ten-part series. So thank you. Um, after Lance's presentation, he'll sit down with WIDA board member Nicole Bivens Collinson of Sam and Travis and Rosenberg to have a discussion here. And then when they're done and Lance uh, is finished, uh, after his remarks and conversation, we'll bring the panel discussion up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lance Briggs. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here today. Do we have a clicker? Yep. There it is. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be uh, in front of you and speak to you about something that's very, very important to us at Union Pacific and important to me personally. Um, we are a large U.S.-based company, right? 30, 32,000 miles of track, 69 billion in assets, 42,000 employees. And um, there's nothing at this moment in time that's more dear to us in terms of global topic than international trade and more specifically NAFTA. Uh, we're tightly connected into the U.S. economy and we'll get into a little bit more detail about that, but our experience uh, has to do with the personal stories of communities that we serve, like uh, farmers in Iowa who grow soybeans that get shipped down to the world's largest crush plant in Reynosa, Mexico, turns into vegetable oil and distributed north of the border in the United States through our grocery stores or a UAW automobile worker in uh, Illinois who's uh, creating dashboards that go down to an assembly plant and get turned into a Silverado pickup truck and distributed again in the United States. Those are, those are very personal uh, stories that we connect to every day. Uh, but before I get into a little bit more of those kinds of details, I want to go to the uh, beginning, begin in the beginning, if you will. Can you forward that for me if somebody's got control? That's a depiction of Abraham Lincoln, of course, uh, and it's uh, around the time that he created the Union Pacific uh, through an act, July 1, 1862, the Pacific Railway Act. And I love that image because it, it is exactly what's going on at the time. A, it's dominated by military officials, right? We're in the middle of the Civil War, actually maybe more like the front end. And B, there is not a team in that picture. Right? You got people looking all over the place, everywhere but uh, behind and at their president. And that's exactly what was going on. The, the Union was losing the Civil War badly. Uh, and in that time of dire consequences, where it's becoming com common knowledge that the Union's going to lose the war, Abraham Lincoln has the presence of mind to think, first, the Union's going to prevail. We are going to be one country. And second, when that happens, we need something to stitch our country back together. He's also got in the back of his mind the, the belief that the paramount, the ultimate goal for government is to create equal opportunity for all, to create equal opportunity for their populace. So with that vision, he signs into creation the first transcontinental railroad. And he did it because 
what better way to stitch the country back together than explore that vast territory we've just acquired in the West. And oh, by the way, that also creates value for every citizen of the United States. And then you fast forward to today, and it's come to life. 155 years later, we ship virtually everything that's attached to the US economy. The clothes you're wearing, the furniture in this room, the building materials for the building, the fuel that keeps the lights on, the car or the conveyance that got you here, all of that at some point was shipped on a railroad. Uh, so we really are deeply connected to the US economy. And that informs, uh, if you will, to the next slide, that informs how we think about our role uh, as a company, as a citizen of the United States. We think about it in terms of vision, mission, and values. Let me start on values, which is our foundation. Uh, everybody at Union Pacific uh, is driven and is, and is uh, committed and holds these dear. First, we have a passion for performance. We want to win. Second, we want to win the right way. The how matters. We have very high ethical standards. So we don't win at any cost, and we don't win at the expense of somebody else. And third, in that context, we understand that running a large enterprise that's uh, one big asset serving all of the economy requires teamwork. There's not one individual Union Pacific Railroader that knows how to run an excellent railroad. There's 42,000 that do it every day. That forms the foundation of what we're built for, which is we're a team dedicated to serve. We are a service provider. We're a service industry. And in that, we build America. That's our, our ultimate goal, is building America. That comes to life in our strategy. Our strategy, that we're unique in the context of how we perceive stakeholders. We think about four key stakeholders that we serve that we're creating long-term enterprise value for, and all four are equally important. So inside the boardroom, we don't check everybody but the shareholders. <coughs> and then when I'm... Uh, Outside in one of our communities, 7,300 communities we serve, we don't check everybody but the community. And when I'm talking to a forum of our employees, I don't ignore everybody but their fulfillment. We have to do all four at the same time to create lasting value. We have to generate excellent returns for the shareholders. We have to fulfill our employees and their work. It has to be something bigger than themselves. We have to build the social and economic fabric of the 7,300 communities that we serve. And we have to provide our customers with an excellent experience, one that helps them win in their marketplace. That six value track strategy is how we do it. It always starts with safety. Uh, in a meeting like this, we would have started this meeting with a safety briefing. We would have talked about if things go wrong, what do we do? How do we plan for when things go right? Who's going to do what? Our goal is uh, records every year until we are an incident-free environment. No injuries, no derailments, no go bads. The second thing we talk about and build every day is an excellent customer experience. And, and the way we think about customer experience is everything from the time a customer thinks they want to ship something, they get a price, they get credit with us, they try to understand what it takes to do it, they track and trace the shipment, all the way to the end where they pay the bill. We've deconstructed that with our customers from their perspective and understand where we have uh, excellence, where we're adding value for them, and where there's pain points. Well, that whole journey represents how they perceive us, and we work on that whole journey with them. That third value track that we build is resource productivity. That's about doing things better every day. We're a capital-intensive company. We have to compete for capital. That fourth value track is about innovation, and that we talk about little I and big I. Little I is the UP way. It's, it's doing what we do better, more safely every day. Big I is big time innovation, like uh, on our railroad, we've got these um, portals that trains run through at 60 miles an hour, and they're essentially MRIs. They take 50,000 images a second of that train via LIDAR, via high-speed digital imagery, infrared, and we build a 3D image of every car on the train. Then we check it against our database, and where that train's gonna terminate, we send the image, and call out where our carmen, who are, are employed to fix cars, should look first. That saves them the time and the, and the effort of walking the train and looking for defects. And oh, by the way, it's way more uh, productive and it's, and it's way more accurate. That fifth value track is uh, maximizing our franchise. That's 
lot of times when I, when I say franchise, uh, we think about the physical footprint of the railroad. That's not our franchise. That's part of it. Our franchise is also our employees, the intellectual property we bring to the work, our products, the relationships we have with our customers. And we're constantly trying to figure out a way how to use those to expand geography, vertical and, and horizontal integration with our customer base. That last value track, and I'm going to get into this later today, after we've talked more deeply about trade, is an engaged team. Uh, that is by far the most important track to me personally and to us as a company. <coughs> Why would a quintessentially U.S. company, all our assets in the western two-thirds of the United States, why would we be here talking to you about international trade? We are quintessentially an American company. We trademarked Building America. The reason why trade matters so much to us is that fully 40% of our business originates or terminates outside the US. We are a global trade enabler. And you can kind of understand that when you look at this map. We serve all the major ports on the West Coast. We are the only railroad that serves the six major rail gateways to and from Mexico. We enjoy 70% of the to and from Mexico <coughs> rail freight traffic. Uh, no, by the way, it's almost balanced north and south. We can talk about that later. So that, that gives you a sense for why trade matters to us. We really fundamentally understand it uh, because we're built for it. That's not a very popular topic right now. In today's world, uh, trade has been demonized, it's been vilified. That happens cyclically. If you pay attention to our politics in the United States, we cyclically ebb and flow through protectionist kind of uh, uh, bents and then not. We seem to be flowing more towards that today. Uh, that all started in the presidential campaign where it was hard to find anybody that championed trade. Uh, and it continues today where uh, an agreement like NAFTA is under dire threat. I'm an optimist. Uh, I think it's going to end up well. But you know the, the, the polarizing aspects of the topic, it's, it's vilified for job loss, uh, and it's vilified for us losing in agreements. And I'm going to dive deeper into the NAFTA agreement specifically so that we can talk a little bit about the facts, because nothing could be further from the truth than what I just said. Let's go to that next slide. Let's talk about some of those facts right now. Prior to the signing of NAFTA until today, so 1993 till today, our trade with the, uh, Canada and Mexico has grown about 400%. They are now by far our largest trading bloc partners. We do about $1.3 trillion of trade with those two countries. Let's put that in perspective. We do more trade with Canada with 37 million people, and this is merchandise, goods trade, where the big jobs are, uh, than we do with the EU with 500 million people. We do more trade, goods trade with Mexico, exports to Mexico, with a population of what, 135 or 140 million, than we do with China, population 1.3 billion, 1.4 billion. Excellent. We do almost two times the amount of goods trade with Mexico as we do with China. It matters, and it matters greatly. Since the signing of NAFTA, we've created about 5 million jobs in those trade-related industries. It now supports about $14.5 billion in trade. Agricultural exports are up about 350%. Uh, our trade balance on services has tripled to the positive. And our services trade right now is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So almost by any measure, it's, it's, it's impossible to look at NAFTA and think that it was a failure. Let's go to the next slide. And, and there's inextricable connectivity amongst our supply chains that's been created through NAFTA. Let me give you a couple examples that are, that are on the railroad. One is, one is shown here. It's, 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 it's my favorite because you can really get it. Uh, who here in the room has had a Corona beer? Yeah, virtually everybody. Everybody knows what Corona beer is. There's one plant in the world that brews the Corona beer for the United States. It's in Nava, Mexico. It's uh, uh, a few dozen miles south of the border at Piedras Negras or Eagle Pass, Texas. That one plant uh, ships about 150 boxcar loads of beer a day. 
uh, up into the north for distribution. Here's a little factoid for you at a, at a cocktail party. One boxcar load of beer allows one six pack a day for 47 years. <laughs> 150 of that every day, right? That beer gets consumed, the bottle gets recycled like it does here in the great city uh, or uh, location of Washington, D.C. And then that crushed glass, Union Pacific ships to a bottling manufacturer in Texas. They, they make bottles and we ship uh, about 7,000 carloads of bottles to the Nava Brewery a year. And then it gets refilled with Corona beer and redistributed in the United States. It's a virtuous cycle for supporting jobs North border and South border, right? It's beautiful. We've made uh, tens of millions of dollars investment to support that. We have a $400 million investment we just put in about four years ago in Santa Teresa, New Mexico, just north of a, uh, an intense Maquiadora area just west of El Paso, Texas. But that investment has increased the amount of businesses around it by 50% in four years. It's added 3,000 jobs in that area in four years. The, the trade to and from Mexico is a U.S. jobs engine. And it's not just about Mexico and Canada, right? 95% of the world's population is outside the U.S. 75% of the world's purchasing power is outside the United States. Trade-related industries pay 18% more in U.S. wages than non-trade-related industries. Uh, in an average job, that's accounting for about $2,000 more a year in income, or more. Right? And think about the trade that happens worldwide with us. The U.S. produces a number of things in quantities that we don't consume, like uh, airplanes, or movies, or software. We need global markets. And we consume a bunch of stuff that we don't produce, or in the quantities that we consume, like cell phones and TVs. <coughs> so also, just kind of fundamental parts of our life, if we want to eat fresh fruits and vegetables in the quantities that we do year round, we have to have markets that grow more than Florida and Texas and California do. So global trade underpins our way of life and underpins our economy. Let's go back to that job loss attached to trade. It's real. So let's deconstruct it. Uh, Ball State University runs a, a center for economic analysis. And they tried to figure out how much of the job loss in manufacturing between 2000 and 2010, it was a total of 5.6 million jobs. How many of those jobs were lost due to trade? And what they ultimately did was they, they got down to about four independent variables that they tested to figure it out. Uh, they tested how much of that job loss was because U.S. consumers are consuming less of U.S. made stuff. They tried to test uh, how much is because we're exporting less U.S. made stuff, how much because we're importing other produced stuff, and how much is due to automation and uh, efficiency, productivity. 88% is due to automation. 88% of the job loss. 12% is due to the balance of trade, as far as they could tell. Right? So there is some job loss related to trade, but it's not the story. It's not even, I mean, I mean it's, it's not an asterisk. Those jobs are real. But what we've got to do is we've got to figure out a way to help U.S. workers be effective in industries that we can compete globally in uh, when they're dislocated from their current jobs. And, and I tell you, the current mechanism is totally inadequate, right? The, uh, uh, Trade-related job loss training uh, is a program that spends about one-tenth of one percent of GDP, along with others, on job retraining for U.S. citizens that have lost their job to international trade. That's woefully inadequate. Most developed economies are spending six-tenths or seven-tenths of their GDP in that area. And we're going hungry for the kind of jobs that we need in the United States. You can read that in virtually any journal you'd like to read that's related to business. Let's take a look at manufacturing in the US. If you, if you read about NAFTA and you read about manufacturing job losses, you would think production in the United States is at an all-time low. That yellow line is manufacturing output in the US. It's at an all-time high. The red line is manufacturing jobs. 
The incessant march there is productivity and efficiency. And that's not a bad thing. That's a law of economics. For us to earn the income that we earn today, that had to happen. More output for every unit of input labor equals more wages next year, period. It's the only way you get more wages next year. Otherwise, it's magic and high inflation. That's real. And uh, it's supportable. It's supportable if we help those who are dislocated to find the jobs that are in demand. And it's supportable if we find more mar markets to compete in. Closing the borders doesn't solve that. Closing the borders makes that really, really painful. Let's go to the next slide. This is an example of one of those high-tech, high-skilled jobs. That's a gentleman, Mr. Davis, that's uh, inside of a detector car. That's a, think about a, like a six-axle truck, and it can be mounted on the rail, and it's got ultrasound imaging heads that look inside the steel for defects. He's monitoring what that feedback looks like, and he makes the judgment call with the help of the computer, but it's ultimately his call on what's a defect and what isn't. That's highly skilled work, and it takes a while for us to train somebody up for that. I've got a friend in Omaha. He owns about two dozen uh, car dealerships. He does not do as much service on the cars that he sells because he can't find skilled technicians to fill his bays. And his bays pay about 80 grand a year with great benefits. So there are these kinds of jobs being created in our economy today. Let's go to the, the wrap up. It's ultimately all about people. I, I, I love this guy. It's, uh, I learned his personal story. He's a Union Pacific employee uh, in the very beginning of this year. Every year I take three trips to different communities that we serve and we talk about uh, how we can help that community. They're public affairs trains trips. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Red, picked the short straw in his area. That's Bakersfield, California. We're finishing a three-day trip. His job was to clean up the yard so it would be pretty for our guests. Right? So that work is all the junk that's accumulated in an area has to be tidied and taken away and, and, and toted away. So you can imagine that works not great. It's that stuff in the background, basically. And that's exactly how he feels about that job or any other job he does, right? He had, he, he had a near-death experience about two years ago. He, he had a, a, a unique and rare disease, and he was, he was having organ failure uh, and his, his doctors basically had his family come in to, to visit him one last time. And then a miracle happened in his, in his community. There was a young lady who lost her life and uh, could give him a kidney. So it started with the kidney. It got him stabilized. got his organs back. Uh, and what he learned out of that experience was what it means to be loved in your company. You know, his coworkers visiting, his boss visiting, the connectivity to his plight. And so today, you know, when I'm, when I'm hearing that story from him, he was bawling on my shoulder because he says it breaks his heart when people don't treat our company right because he knows what it is. He knows what it represents. That's engaged team. Those are the jobs that trade supports. That's what we need more of in the United States. With that, I think we're going to get into our panel.